Hello and welcome to this week's edition of World Today where we will focus on Afghanistan and bring you an exclusive conversation with the top leadership of the Taliban. For a country, the name, flag and people are its true identity. Unfortunately, Afghanistan is fighting a war of identity on all fronts. Between the Taliban and the Afghan administration now, there is an ongoing crisis and fight over the official name of Afghanistan the national anthem where the music should be allowed or not and the national flag which has been pulled down from various parts of the country leaving an entire population absolutely torn here is where we talk about this war of identity that looms large in afghanistan And with this begins another struggle for the Afghans, War of the Flags. As of today, the streets of Afghanistan are witnessing a change which is being welcomed, shunned and feared all at the same time. A day after the Taliban entered the capital city of Kabul, the first signs of change were seen with the change of the flags. Down came the red, green and black Afghan national flag and up went the white banner bearing a shahada. Taking the freedom is the right of all nations. The Afghan people, by using their legal right after 20 years of jihad, were able to take their freedom and clean their country from the occupation and occupiers. And then the change of name from Islamic Republic of Afghanistan to Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Any resistance to those changes have been met with violence. The removal of the Afghan flag triggered protests in the eastern city of Jalalabad, leading to death of a few Afghans. I am standing here in front of you. You can hit me with 30 bullets. I will sacrifice my life for this flag. This is my flag. My government will soon be back. Three different flags are trying to reinforce their idea of Afghanistan. The Taliban's white banner, the Afghan national flag, and the flag of the Northern Alliance that is reassertion good itself from distant Panjshir Valley slain leader Mohammad Shah Massoud's bastion. The only difference is that Panjshir's resistance, black, white and green, is fighting for the reinstatement of the Afghan administration under the leadership of Ahmad Massoud and Amrullah Saleh, the first vice president of Afghanistan. Strangely, this is not the first time Afghanistan's flag has changed. Since the Emirate of Afghanistan became fully independent from Britain more than 100 years ago, its flag has changed at least 18 times. If one were to go by the United States of America, then by President Biden's own admission, nobody anticipated the manner in which the Taliban decimated the Afghan administration in a matter of days. While the world was caught completely unawares, there are bigger problems at hand. One evacuation of their nationals from Afghanistan, but also a bigger problem of the schism that now exists between those who have legitimized the Taliban, those who do not want to recognize the Taliban administration, and then there are those fence-sitters who want to wait and watch. The Taliban have very few friends, those who might vouch for them. Pakistan comes top of that list. When you adopt someone's culture, you believe it to be superior and you end up becoming a slave to it. People of Afghanistan are breaking the shackles of slavery. The 
but not all Pakistan allies or stakeholders are as enthused with the regime change that has brought utter chaos to Afghanistan, putting the country's governance and governing system in a tizzy. While the Taliban have found legitimacy with the US backing down, DC is yet to formally acknowledge them as the legitimate representative of the people. The world is divided on account of whether to recognize the Taliban as the future of Afghanistan or wait to see what the final face of the government would look like once the newly formed council presents the new administration. Meanwhile, it is wait and watch for many. Uh, if we are going to recognize a government, we'll have to wait till the government is formed. I have stated our overall position on Afghan issue. We look forward to an open, inclusive and widely representative regime in Afghanistan. Only after that, we will come to the question about diplomatic recognition. We are in no rush to recognize the new Taliban government, just like all the other countries. Yesterday, I spoke with the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and our positions converge. There are many others who are concerned about the situation on the ground. German Chancellor Angela Merkel called the latest developments in Afghanistan bitter and admitted that the efforts by foreign powers to change the country did not work as planned. And that is an erkenntnis die is bitter. This is a realization that is bitter, bitter for many Afghans that were active along the way. But our efforts were obviously not strong enough. It takes a lot more time than we thought. We were in Afghanistan for 20 years and this time it did not work. So we have to say that our efforts were not successful and we have to learn our lessons and set ourselves smaller goals on those missions. Und seine Ziele auch ähm, kleiner fassen muss, glaube ich, bei solchen Einsätzen. Turkey and Jordan expressed their desire for calm, peace and stability. But at the moment, there needs to be calm in the country. We would like to say that we have welcomed the positive messages that have come from the Taliban so far. I hope we see this in actions towards foreigners, diplomatic missions and their own people. We, as Turkey, will continue to support the economic development, stability, peace and tranquility of brotherly Afghanistan. We are all concerned about how things turned out in Afghanistan. The priority now is to ensure security and stability. The priority now is to ensure respect for the rights of citizens and to find ways that allow evacuation of non-Afghan citizens who want to leave Afghanistan. The European Union has no immediate plans to recognize the Taliban, but is open to engaging with the Taliban. We'll have to get in touch with the authorities in Kabul. The authorities in Kabul, wherever they are, they are. the Taliban have won the war. So we will have to talk with them in order to engage in a dialogue as soon as necessary to prevent a humanitarian and a potential migratory disaster, but also a humanitarian crisis. This dialogue will also have to focus on the means to prevent the return of foreign terrorist presence in Afghanistan, something that uh, certainly is also very high in our agenda. The stakes are high and the Taliban wants diplomatic ties with the global community. The choice is hard. To isolate the Taliban would mean leaving the women, children, minorities of the country to their own devices. Engaging them would mean compromising on the idea of democracy. But paramount is peace and stability. For Afghanistan, for the region and for the world. On Spotlight this weekend is 
a world exclusive. India Today is the only channel to have reached out to the Taliban leadership. My colleague Ashraf Wani spoke with the top leadership of the Taliban, Khairullah Harkwa, as also Abdul Salam Hanafi, and asked them about the future of Afghanistan and how do they intend to rule the country. Take Nine members political form of the Taliban has reached Afghanistan. They entered first to the Kandahar, which is the main city of Taliban where it got its birth. Then they proceeded to the Kabul. Headed by Maulana Brother Abdul Ghani, the delegation has made it clear that they are with its word what they have announced. So far, they have clearly said that they are announcing amnesty for all and will protect not only the Afghans but in fact all the civilians who are inside the Afghanistan from different countries. Today or tomorrow the final shape of the Taliban government will be uh, formed and it will be clear that who is going to head the Afghanistan. So far India today is only the channel which has got first reaction from the high profile political bureau of Taliban in Kandahar. Pardon all Afghan officials who went against us. No one is our enemy from now on. We hope people realize this. It is a happy occasion. We are back in our nation after long. Happy that all cities are under our control. We'll ensure respect for all Afghan officials. Won't destroy livelihoods, won't take land. Don't flee Afghanistan out of fear. Urge those who fled Afghanistan to come back. Everyone will get entitled dues. Lots of sacrifices to build Afghanistan of today. We will follow law of the land. The Taliban of 2021 no longer look the rabid, ragged, indisciplined, disheveled militia they used to be seen in grainy visuals beating up women and caning them during their barbaric rule over Afghanistan. Now they are a disciplined legion of well-fed fighters and why wouldn't they be? The Taliban is amongst one of the richest organizations. They are well-funded and their annual budget amounts to over a billion dollars in hard cash. Here is where we take a look at the cash-rich Taliban. An army cannot fight on an empty stomach. And that is true of the ragtag Taliban militia that seem to have taken Afghanistan with relative ease. It has been estimated that the Taliban had at their disposal an annual budget 30 times more than what the official government of Afghanistan spent on its military. No wonder then that the Taliban of 2021 looked very different from the Taliban of the late 1990s. For one, the visual getup of the Afghan militant outfit is snazzier. 
even before they took over the arsenal left by the US, their weapons looked brand new and shiny. Their Humvee or Humvee type vehicles were in perfect running order. The clothes that they wore looked clean and new. These were all indications of an organization flush with funds because nothing spells success better than a thick, fat wallet. So how much is the Taliban worth and where does their money come from? In 2016, Forbes listed Taliban as the fifth richest of the ten terrorist organizations that they had featured. ISIS had a turnover then of 2 billion US dollars and was top dog. Taliban at number five had a modest annual turnover of 400 million dollars. And this was in 2016 when it was out of power. Forbes listed Taliban's primary sources of revenue as drug trafficking, protection money and donations. According to a NATO confidential report, the annual budget of the Taliban in financial year 2019-20 had been $1.6 billion, a 400% increase in four years when compared to the Forbes figures of 2016. A breakdown of the revenues listed the different heads under which Taliban earned their dollars. Mining. 464 million dollars drugs 416 million dollars foreign donations 240 million dollars export 240 million dollars protection 160 million dollars real estate 80 million dollars the confidential NATO report had highlighted the fact that the Taliban leadership was chasing self-sufficiency in order to become an independent political and military entity. Over the years, the organization had been reducing its dependency on foreign donations and contributions. In 2017-18, the Taliban received an estimated $500 million funding from foreign sources. This then accounted for about half of its total revenues. By 2020, the percentage of foreign funding had reduced to roughly 15% of their total revenues. Force larger in size. The US, meanwhile, spent almost a trillion dollars over 19 years in military spending in Afghanistan. Most of the money was used to either fight the Taliban or in training Afghan forces who would fight the Taliban. But finally, it all went to waste as the Taliban literally walked in to take control of Kabul and by extension, the whole of Afghanistan. So no wonder then that they look so pleased with themselves as their business is flourishing and their profit graph is headed roofwards. Welcome back to World Today. It's time to flip the pages of archives. 30 years ago, a group of communist officials ousted Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and flooded Moscow with tanks when the world looked in disbelief. Fearing a rollback on liberal reforms and a return to the Cold War confrontation, but that was not to be. The coup didn't last three days, but it did precipitate the breakup of the Soviet Union, which the plotters said they were trying to prevent. Let's take a look at those three days of August 1991 that led to the breakup of the Soviet Union. On 18th August 1991, several top lieutenants arrived at the then Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev's Black Sea vacation home. They urged him to impose a nationwide state of emergency. They were trying to prevent the signing of a union treaty between Soviet republics. It was a document Gorbachev saw as a way to shore up the crumbling Soviet Union. But his lieutenants differed in opinion. When Gorbachev refused to endorse the state of emergency, they cut off his communications and left him isolated. 
he was considering him to be too, too mediocre, incapable of organizing anything uh, serious or challenging him or presenting a real danger. The very next day, the Soviet Union woke up to the televised broadcast of a terse statement declaring that Gorbachev was unfit to govern for health reasons and that the State Committee on the State of Emergency was created to save the country from sliding into chaos and anarchy. Just as the statement came, hundreds of tanks and other armoured vehicles rolled into Moscow. I woke up that day to what sounded like rumbling of tanks. I live near the television tower, which was blocked off by then, of course. Then I came to the White House. Here, there were also tanks and people who were gathering around. Eventually, the then Russian president made an address atop one of those tanks. At that point of time, Boris Yeltsin enjoyed broad popularity as the leader of pro-democracy forces and had just won the presidential election. As crowds of demonstrators grew around Yeltsin's headquarters, coup plotters faltered. The mastermind of the coup, the KGB chief, had the KGB's Alpha Commando unit surround Yeltsin's residence. The order to detain wasn't given. When we did it, we decided to try to get to the office despite the risks. The coup started to crumble. On the third day, two lakh protesters rallied near the Russian government headquarters to defy the coup. Yeltsin's ally, Andrei Dunayev, ordered about 1,000 cadets of police academies to come to Moscow to protect Yeltsin's headquarters with weapons. It discouraged the coup plotters from using force. Three protesters were killed and several others were wounded when a crowd of demonstrators tried to stop a convoy of armoured vehicles they thought was heading to storm Yeltsin's headquarters. Hours after the clash, Troops were ordered to leave Moscow in the morning of August 21st. The following day, all the coup plotters were arrested and Gorbachev returned to Moscow. He was kept prisoner for three days by the organizers of the coup. But uh, when he was freed and uh, had the possibility to return to Moscow, uh, he was already the hostage of Yeltsin because he owed to him his liberation. Less than four months later, Yeltsin and leaders of other Soviet republics declared the Soviet Union defunct and Gorbachev stepped down on the Christmas Day of 1991. The arrested coup plotters faced trial but were amnestied three years later in 1994. That's all on the show, but before I go, I leave you with this. Afghan women on the tarmac of Hamid Karzai International Airport singing Sar Zameen Man, My Land, written by a poet, a Hazara poet. Ironically, Hazaras are one of the most persecuted community in Afghanistan, and the shadow of the women clearly show the shadows of uncertainty that looms large over Afghanistan. Goodbye and take care.